Next Curve. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Rethink Podcast. I'm Leonard Lee, Managing Director of Next Curve, and today I have one of, if not the leading, semiconductor industry analyst joining me today, Mario Morales, Group Vice President of IDC uh, of semiconductors and everything electronic, right? Uh, yeah, almost everything electronic, but everything <laughs> embedded at least. Yeah, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks, Leonard, for inviting awesome. me. Awesome. Yeah, no, and I'm really, it's really, really great to have you. And I just want to compliment you on your goatee. Oh, well, thank uh, you. I, I and you, you as well. <laughs> <laughs> you as well. We started growing it just a couple of days yeah, ago. Yeah, exactly. Over the weekend, in fact, right? Yeah, just yeah, for you, actually. Wonderful. <laughs> we're, we're in a drift. I don't yes. know if you've ever watched the movie Pacific Rim, but we're in a drift. So this this promises okay. to be a great discussion. So, <laughs> so <laughs> hey, um, why don't you take a moment to share a little bit something about your background, you know, your role at IDC and sure. some of the great work that you do? Sure. So Mario Morales, I, I've been in the semiconductor industry for over 30 years. Can you believe it? Uh, I started off uh, when I was about 20 and um, covering, I, I realized early on in my career that I that it was important for us to look at the semiconductor space. This was before companies like NVIDIA and Broadcom were formed, but I've been covering the space for, for that long initially at at DataQuest, which was acquired by Gartner. Then I moved over to NEC for a little while doing strategic planning. And now I've been at IDC now for 25 years. Uh, I managed to semiconductor wow. practice here and, and spent a lot of time with some of the larger names like TSMC and Intel and Qualcomm, but also a lot of time with system companies like Google and, and Meta and others, uh, tracking this space, looking at the different dynamics within the semiconductor area, along with uh, with also supporting our Wall Street clients. Wow, wow, that's amazing. And you know, isn't it weird how semiconductors have just become such a thing lately over the past few years, or actually maybe the past couple of years? Yeah, I, I think so. I think I think in general, we've seen sort of a resurgence in the semiconductor space. It's yeah. always been very a uh, critical area, but I think it yeah. lost itself when when you started seeing a lot of software companies and internet companies emerge. Yeah. A lot of those those business models go to market much faster than making silicon and designing silicon. Right. I mean, right. whenever you invest in this space, it's a five year plus right. journey. And yeah. so people sort of forgot about semiconductors, yeah. but we're seeing a resurgence now when, right. especially after the pandemic and, yeah. and even with what you're seeing today with the current constraints. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the way I like, I, I think of it is this, is that we became enamored with this whole notion of software as eating the world. And so everyone thought software is everything, but little did, or little did people know, maybe, or they forgot that you need hardware to run software on, right? That's correct. And, and I think semiconductors yeah. in general, if you think about semiconductors, it's it's basically hard-coded hard -coded software in, in transistors and silicon, right? right? So yeah. it's one and the same. I think that That's the semiconductor industry embodies both. And, yeah. and I think if you look at some of the biggest semiconductor companies, they invest equally if not more in software than they do in hardware so right. i think it's a very unique industry yeah well hey today we will be talking about this very hot topic right which is the chip supply chain it's something that uh, i think over the past i would say two years has been a bit of a a thing and specifically we'll be talking about the chip industry and the need for resiliency so, you know, we're, we already know that there's some challenges that we have with the chip supply chain, but I'm really interested in exploring with you, uh, Mario, what does resiliency mean? Because that's, I think, something that we're trying to achieve, um, you, you know, going forward from the status quo of today. And we'll touch on the following four discussion points. Number one, uh, the chip crisis. How did we get to where we are today? Uh, then we'll talk about what does the chip supply chain resiliency concept mean or that idea mean. And then we'll talk about what are the strategies in place and what are the industry implications for pursuing resiliency. And then finally, we'll just cap things off with what are the risks and opportunities for overhauling the chip supply chain as we know it today. 
So okay, so that's not like okay. A full plate. It sounds like a full plate. So let's get started. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. So uh, let's start off with the first bit. So the crip, the chip, the crip, the chip crisis. How did we get here? I think we got here. There are various factors, right? The, it was a what people call a black swan, right? So we yeah. we we got the the shock from the pandemic was one, um, but I think people panicked very quickly. And and what we we saw was companies had already been under investing a couple of years ago because there was a correction back in 2019 of the semiconductor space. So there was companies coming out of that under invested in specific technologies and specific process nodes. And, and then you got the shock of the pandemic. We saw not only a shift in enterprise spending and a lot of caution about where they're going to put their money, but also a changing in behavior, especially as we shut down. You know, people started moving more and more work towards towards their home. So working remotely, right. we started learning remotely. And that really changed a lot of the dynamics of the market itself. At the same time, in other vertical industries like automotive, um, you know, the automotive industry shut down. And, and what they made mistakes on was they really... They were operating in a just-in-time environment, yeah. and they were pushing out orders away from their suppliers. And suppliers were fortunate enough to see some shifts in the market, so they moved a lot of their supply to other markets that were that would basically consume their capacity. Mm-hmm. And so that moved the automotive industry back to the end of the line, mm-hmm. and it and it's taken some time to recover because. What we're also seeing is that some parts of the supply chain are very inefficient. So you can get parts into these spaces, but you still got to test these parts. You got to, you know, package these parts and then move them across the subsystems that exist. So, so I think a lot of it was under investment. Uh, Vendors themselves didn't really have very good business continuity plans. You know, how do I mitigate risk? when you go through such a, such a shock like the pandemic did, right? And then you start get going through the point where the demand is rebounding a lot faster and stronger than you ever anticipated. Yeah. And then you it's about also about not being able to manage your inventory yeah. and not having close enough ties to your supply base. Mm-hmm. And so these are the, some of the factors that contributed to right. the constraints that even to, to this right. day we continue to see. Right, right. Now, but what about? I mean, even before all of this, we also had the China, the this uh, brewing, you know, sort of issues, you know, with uh, China, right, from a trade and tech front. Uh, I mean, if you want to call it the the China U.S. or the U.S. China tech war, uh, you know, um, there there were certain disruptions that were happening as a result of some of the policies that were being, you know, sort of this tit for tat type of dynamic that was happening there as well. Right. Absolutely. I I mean, I think if you look back to 2019, you know, 2019 saw a correction of about 12% for the total semiconductor market. So basically the industry declined by 12%. But if you look more closely to that year for the first three quarters of that year, Many of the service providers were very bloated. I'm talking about the the Amazons, the Googles, yeah. the Microsoft. They had been ordering so much yeah. in 2017 and 2018 that yeah. they had had to digest a lot of inventory right. for the first three quarters of that year. Right. At the same time, Huawei, of course, got word that they were at some point in time going, going to be sanctioned, right? right? And so they started ordering, just uh, hoarding as much as as uh, much product as they could. So that gave this illusion that the market was actually doing quite well, when in fact, there was a lot that was already bubbling that was going to really result in a correction for that given year. So I think that definitely we did see the tariffs as part of it and a a shift in in the distribution channels, how companies go to market in China, where they can source their parts. And, right. and what kind of mitigation they can have in right. terms of the, the right. risk that they have potentially being sanctioned if you're associated right. with, with Huawei or even ZTE before Huawei. Right, right. right. And, and those that sanction program, which was uh, you know, kind of broadly known as the entity list, right? Right. Um, that, uh, that was much broader than Huawei, though, right? And I, I think one of the things that I've observed in the research that we do is um, there was, um, uh, you know, a good deal of stockpiling. So we heard a lot about stockpiling about that time. And you also saw a lot of the Chinese OEMs uh, start to carry more inventory. It, it, it was present, you know, in their That's financials. Right. And uh, and so oddly, uh, 
when the pandemic hit, they had a they had that stockpile. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> and it took them um, from a lot of uh, the angst that. Um, you know, uh, companies, electronics companies in other regions uh, suffered when there was that supply chain shock, right? That's right. I mean, if you look at the Chinese vendors closely in, mm. as we exited 2019, you got into 2020, they definitely had reserves. Yeah. So the pandemic hits and China's one of the first places to shut down, but they actually opened up much faster as well because, right. Right. And, 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 and you really didn't see any real disruption because there was enough product in the market at that point in time. But as right. we got to the end of 2020, mm -hmm. then you started realizing that you're at levels now that you cannot sustain your business with. Yeah. And at the same time, you got this these sanctions with Huawei. Huawei was going through their own turmoil, right? And you saw them split out their, yeah. their phone business now with the Honor brand on its own. Right. Right. Uh, so you saw some of these things happen. But if you look more closely at the first half of last year in 2021, that's when you started seeing a real impact to the inventory situation. And, and, and not only that, but we started seeing um, increases in costs. So material costs to build components to mm -hmm. uh, all of that started to take fold. And that's one of the reasons right. why by the second quarter of 2021, we started seeing wafer prices increase and mm -hmm. mem memory prices, of course, were also soaring at that time. Yeah. And then you get into the second half of the year, the demand sustained itself, right. I think up to right. September, October timeframe. Yeah. And we really didn't see any change in the tightness other than the foundry right. companies began to at least get closer to where the demand levels were right. for their customers. Yeah. But what's interesting to point out during that same time frame was that we started seeing this shift in, in the constraints that moved from front-end manufacturing, you know, folks like TSMC and yeah. UMC and Global Foundries, to more of the back-end because we were putting a lot more of the concentration and focus on front-end. We completely ignored the fact that at the end of the day, you got to test all of these chips, yeah. you got to package them, and then you got to move them back into the, the end product, right? right and right. so that's where we're at today is there, there's a bottleneck there yeah. because the OSAT companies have continued to underinvest, and we're now starting to see them invest now. And I think it'll alleviate the situation in the second half of this year. Right, right. So we're, I mean, we're dealing with all kinds of crazy lead times that uh, impact the, uh, the actual capacity, the arrival of capacity, right? That's right. Um, you know, not just from a process perspective, but even from a capacity standpoint, right? Yeah, we do. We, we are. I, I think when you look at it now, the biggest challenge now is, is around materials, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some companies have, have taken, um, they're taking that into their own hands. So they're now, you look at Intel or uh, TSMC, they're actually building their own substrates in, within their own capacity to mm -hmm. meet their own needs, right? Mm -hmm. But the rest of the industry is sort of having to wait for yeah. the wafer companies, the substrate yeah. companies to kind of keep ramping their, their supply. Yeah. At the other end is, and I think the bigger concern is gonna be the, the equipment and tools. You know, the stuff that actually goes into a fab, we're now seeing lead times closer to 60 weeks, right? So that's even yeah. more than a year to be able to get a tool that you ordered, let's say last year. So, you know, so what it what it means on, on a longer term basis is that if you're a big company like TSMC or Intel or Samsung, who probably drive more than 50% of the overall right. spending, you'll be able to get your, your tools. But if you're a second tier, you know, and you have very aggressive uh, capital spending plans, it's going to take time because I think that's where you're going to see the impact to the timing of when that capacity comes online. So wow. I think there is some challenges still to, to overcome. And if, if you're not, you know, the th crazy thing about this industry is that they never seem to get it right. Right. So, so they'll build out and then they, the, the demand patterns change. And, and yeah. so now you're stuck with this capacity. And I think that 2023 could be a year where, where, you know, you're going to see ample capacity, but the demand because of, you know, whether it's the Ukraine, Russia war, or you look at inflation, some of these macro factors, you know, we're, we're beginning to feel some of it now, but by the end of this year is when you start seeing it in, take fold. And I think anything that yeah. is consumer facing will change, will just see more volatility, right? Yeah. So I think that that's always the challenge with supply and demand and with yeah. this, with the industry is that, not only do you still see boom and bust cycles, but you also yeah. see a lot of these suppliers that invest heavy, heavy dollars right. so, sometimes miss that window, right? And I yeah. think that there is a, a, a danger in, in seeing that. Yeah, and I well, I think we'll touch on that a little later on. So, but no what you're you're outlining sounds like a great 
opportunity to apply AI. <laughs> yeah, I think you'll Just probably kidding. see it. No, but I, I think you can, right? <laughs> yeah. If I mean, you're seeing you it today with some of the CRM systems and what you see for inventory management, uh -huh. you look at what SAP is doing. These right. guys are all trying to implement ways to automate, right? Because right. you have to have as much visibility as you can across yeah. your supply chain. So right. I wouldn't I wouldn't count out AI, right, in, in some of these oh, yeah. things. If they can do it right. It, this it, is one of these things, these yeah. areas where it does make a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, it makes a, a lot of sense. I mean, this is not a topic that we're supposed to be talking about. It makes <laughs> a lot of sense in a lot of places, but it's typically aspirational. But, uh, you know, definitely in an area where uh, some more predictive capabilities would be very useful provided that you had that kind of supply chain visibility which is always really difficult to acquire um yeah. but I, I think that's uh, you you're maybe highlighting one of the the challenges that uh we need to start looking at uh with in you know in earnest in tandem with the whole uh, resiliency topic so uh, you know really quickly i wanted to ask you about um IOT and because you mm -hmm. know one of the things that you and I have talked about is the the fact that you know a lot of the tightness is around the mature nodes right um, that's right yeah and um, what kind of what kind of um, supply demand behaviors or dynamics you've seen there over the last uh, couple of years well I think that in in general as I said earlier there's been a lack of investment in these spaces because yeah. when you think about the foundry equation to yeah. mature technologies uh, the foundry companies in those spaces today are basically operating depreciated capacity which means yeah. that if they keep these things at high utilization rates they're printing money they're doing yeah. extremely well their margins are very fat and you want to be in that type of situation right and if demand becomes more predictable where your customers are allocating for a year in advance it just makes it for a very good business mm -hmm. and so the risk proposition for these companies now is that now they have to take on the risk of 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 addressing the upside or addressing the fact that customers are still demanding more capacity and mm -hmm. in that case one of the things we're starting to see is that the mature companies, the UMCs and global foundries of the world, they're now beginning to establish partnerships with their strategic customers where the, the customer themselves are investing in the capacity to mm -hmm. make sure that they get guarantees, to uh -huh. mitigate the risk, and actually to also make pricing a lot more predictable. Right. And for a foundry company that is making a, a power management IC or making an image sensor mm -hmm. or an LCD driver or an automotive IC, all of these guys really like that kind of environment because in the markets that right. they serve, they're very long tail markets, right? They're seven, yeah. 10 years of support. So once you get a customer locked in, you have them locked in for a very long yeah. time. So yeah. I think this is the kind of environment that you're in now. Yeah. And you're seeing Global Foundries has probably been the most vocal company where they're talking more about you know, an established booking base of over 3 billion this year. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at over the next three to four years, they have over $12 billion of revenue already kind of booked essentially with certain, some of their customers. Now, mm -hmm. some of it is fungible where if the customer sees oversupply, they might push out some of those orders, mm -hmm. but in essence, they get a guarantee that they have partners that will fund and mitigate the risk of their investment in right. their capacity. Right. Wow. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. And no, no worries. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to our next topic here, which is the uh, chip supply chain resiliency idea or concept. I mean, what does what does it mean when we say we want to make our supply chain for semiconductors and chips more resilient? I mean, uh, can you kind of break that down for yeah, our I, audience? I, I, yeah, I think that when you think about resiliency, there's a couple factors that you have to factor in. I think the first one is being able to adjust to the, the actual demand itself. So yeah. having the flexibility in your supply chain to adjust to any upside or any downside that you might see in your, your core demand or the demand of your customer. So that's one piece of it that is important for resiliency. The second one is that you have an experienced team managing your supply chain, one that is actually taking a, a very close look at, at any type of risk, learning from past, from the past, right? Whether it's an earthquake, a tsunami, or even the, the, the current pandemic that we've gone through, it's being able to have a team that is prepared 
to know what your options are going to be. If you're working already with 140 suppliers, what are the most essential parts that you need? And right. can you ensure that those parts uh, don't go away with any kind of disaster, right? So just being able to have a, a really solid continuity plan, one that can right. be tested and, and is constantly tested by this team, I think is essential. Mm -hmm. And then I think also from a customer standpoint, when you look at it in terms of resiliency is having a very close tie and a close window into your strategic customers. Uh -huh. So I think part of the mistake the automotive industry made was that they weren't aligned very well with their with their suppliers, with their partners. They treated them like they're more like distributors as opposed to strategic partners. And, and I think if you're lockstep with your customer, you guys share the risk. And right. if you can share that risk, then there's a lot more resiliency that you can have. Hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. And so how, how does the... Um resiliency approach then uh, play out in terms of you know uh, some of the actions that are being proposed you know uh, more uh, you know let's say less from a, a individual companies level or end market level but more from an industry perspective more from the from the public sector you mean from, like the no, government the, the semi, and... uh, well uh, let's talk about the industry first and then we'll talk about the sure. government Right. So I think one of the things that you're starting to see is, is you're, you're now seeing companies reevaluate their partners. So they're, they've gone back and said, okay, these specific products are, are essential to us operating. So we need to align ourselves closer to those suppliers that offer those products. Yeah. We need to be willing to hold on to more inventory. Right. You know, in areas like automotive and industrial, there's a lot of just-in-time kind of inventory yeah. management. Yeah. That works very well in when supply and demand are very balanced. But when you see an imbalance in the industry, it makes a lot more sense to have more flexibility in what you can do. So you're seeing the industry now willing to hold more inventory in the channel, trying mm -hmm. to kind of add more inventory at the vendor level as well. Right. And that really is good for the supplier because the supplier now can have less risk themselves because what's happened over the last decade or so has been that the suppliers are holding a lot of the risk. They're the ones that have the finished good products and they're sitting in their own um, inventory channels as opposed to the customer's inventory. Right. And only when the customer takes it, can they recognize the revenue? So having some flexibility in how you do that, I think uh -huh. is gonna help the industry get better at it. And at the same time, just knowing and having transparency between the vendor right. and the investment that the semiconductor suppliers are making is critical, right? Mm -hmm. And knowing the timing and the inflection point right. of when those products should right. be in the market, should right. be in front of the customer. Right. And, but we're, we're also hearing a lot about things such as, you know, re, uh, regional diversification, localization, <laughs> right? I mean, one of the... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. The odd revelations. Oh, no problem. Uh, the one of the, it, 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 it seems like it was a revelation due to the pandemic. It, for some reason, people are attributing it to the pandemic that something like 12% of um, semiconductor manufacturing is happening in the United States. Uh, somehow that became a shock to everyone. Uh, yeah. But we're hearing a, a lot of talk about you know, uh, diversifying away from Asia because uh, something I, I I don't know what the I don't recall what the percentage is, but it's a large percentage. You you probably know the exact number of uh, manufacturing that ha happens out of Asia, whether it's South Korea, uh, Taiwan, um, China, or Singapore, what have you, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, we hear a lot about that. We hear also a lot about um, like resiliency from a security standpoint or from a trust standpoint. What are your thoughts there in terms of how those factors um, are, uh, you know, uh, you know, contribute to this idea of resiliency? Sure. I think when you think about what's happened, um, you look at where, you know, Asia is a very strong concentration of manufacturing yeah. and assembling and testing. And the pandemic was a, a good reminder that, that you have to mitigate your risk. Mm -hmm. And the challenge though, is that for the last two decades, not only have we continued to outsource manufacturing, but we're basically outsourcing everything. Design, if you look at India, India has fostered because of design and software development, right? China is different. They've, they fostered because of the hardware 
ecosystems that have been built. And they're not easy to replicate because it's not just about where you're building, but having the infrastructure, right? right. Having the bridges, the railroads, the airports, the, you know, you name it, the ports, all of that stuff took time in China. Right. And it's been decades in the making, right? And today, China has the largest ports in the world. So yeah. I think it's interesting that you're starting to see now more, more regions try to take control of their sovereignty. Um, and, and you're going to see a lot of money poured into it. But if it's not done with a complete lens where you're looking at not just manufacturing, but design and IP and and OSAT and testing and you name it, the, the entire ecosystem. If you don't do it holistically like that, you're gonna right. fail, right? And at the end of the day, the reason why this occurred was because US-based companies, European-based companies, they went on this movement to drive more profitability and outsource right. a lot more. And, and they help foster the investment that we have seen um, pay dividends in, in places like China. Right. And so now you're stuck with the fact that this has been decades in the making yeah. and, and for the U S to kind of reestablish its position in this domain, it's yeah. going to take more than a decade to be able to do that. Oh, right. Same with yeah. Europe. So, so it's going to take a while, but I, I understand that a lot of it is because of, of trying to establish sovereignty again and trying to mitigate the risk, but it has to be a very comprehensive and, and far-reaching view of, of the entire supply chain, I think, to be successful. And what cannot be ignored is the fact that at the end of the day, these this industry is very interconnected. And China is the largest consuming market in the world, whether right. it's for PCs, smartphones, automotive, you name yeah. it, gaming, all of these different yeah. markets now yeah. are, are driven, yeah, driven by China. So even though you establish yourself in the US, you still got to have a position in China. And so I think at, at some point in time, the US and China will have to come back to the table and yeah, figure out a plan that makes sense for everyone, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I actually had a, a, a podcast or a, a webinar with uh, um, Roger Entner. I don't know if you're familiar with him of uh, Recon Analytics. And we were talking about, uh, you know, sort of this broader, um, the, the broader electronics industry and you know the the fact that you, this supply chain that we have today to your point right i mean it, it's it's a result of like literally 30 years of uh, of um you know globalization but it's not just china it, it really started off with you know japan south korea That's taiwan right. you know in the you know i, I would say in the 80 uh, 90s yeah and, and that's really where you, that you then had that beachhead into um, China, right? Starting with Hong Kong, because you know packaging and and, and yep. testing, a lot of that stuff was happening in uh, Hong Kong a long time ago, right? So, yeah. um, you know, it's not that China overnight. Um, well, sort of. I guess it is kind of overnight, <laughs> but it, it, it's it there. There's a, a lot more involved in the story then, you know, just all of a sudden China becoming a, a, a presence, right? It, uh, it's, it also comes down to industrialization. If you think right, about, right. Uh, and you studied in, in industries, you know, you look at some of the original industries in Europe and, and even what's happened in the US, you go through this period of many decades going through this industrialization. Right, right. And we're just now seeing this, but China, is on their phase of industrialization. It could be yeah. 50 years of this kind of movement, right? Just like we did, we right. did it in, after the, the Second World War in the right. U.S. Mm -hmm. You're now, you, know, you saw Japan go through the same thing, and now it's China's turn. And I think some of that, we can try to contain it in the U.S. with tariffs and try to protect our technology, right. or we can choose to embrace it and support it with our own technology and foster with the growth right. that we see in that region. But at the end of the day, these re these markets are very interconnected. Yeah, so, you're, you're right. So both the yeah. U.S. and China at some point in time have to come <laughs> to terms to 
you know, just accepting the reality right. of one right. market being a demand driver and a center of, of, of manufacturing excellence. And yeah. the other one is more service oriented and, and will continue to be uh, right. over the foreseeable future. Right. But wouldn't you say that we're still, I mean, couldn't you argue that we're still at the forefront of design? I mean, I know that you brought up India, but uh, you know, some of the leading design houses are out of the United States, right? I mean, they're U.S. Absolutely. Brands, U.S. companies. And, that is still, you know, I, I think when we, we've done an assessment of the total supply chain and what we've uncovered, one of the key points was that more than 50% of the value is actually not in manufacturing. It's in the IP, the design, the yeah. testing, the packaging, all this other stuff that happens, right? So we're already there. And I think if you look closely at the value proposition of someone like Qualcomm, yeah. or MediaTek or Broadcom or NVIDIA, NVIDIA. Where, where a lot of these companies are essentially, they're semiconductor companies, but they don't they don't build the chips themselves anymore. They rely right. on a close partnership with TSMC or Samsung right. or right. someone else, right? But yeah, that already exists and that will continue to be an area where, where we lead. I think the IP area is another space where yeah. both Europe and the US have established a very unique IP business model. You yeah. look at one of the best IP companies out there and it's Qualcomm. You see how much money they generate with TCL. Yeah. And a lot of that has been because they've been able to lead at the technology front of it and be able to yeah. license that. And, yeah. you know, ARM is the same position. You start yeah. going across the board, Rambus and some of these other companies. But I think those areas, EDA, you look at equipment and tools, a lot of that is still centered. You know, 90% of the tool companies are outside of the Asia and so, you know, right. that's where you're still seeing some leadership position right. that you right. cannot discount. Right. And then, you know, going back to your earlier comment about resiliency and risk management, I think one of the, the I mean, I'd like to get your take on this. I think one of the elements of resiliency from an industry uh, perspective, especially uh, local <laughs> industry perspective, is economic and geopolitical bargaining power. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've seen that play out, whether it's um, with, um, you know, um, uh, some of the big uh, transactions that uh, didn't go through. Right. right. <laughs> you know, whether it was Broadcom, uh, Qualcomm Broadcom, uh, you know, whether it was, you know, early on, even though the NVIDIA arm thing didn't go through uh, the drama that was happening in China. Uh, but, um, you know, I, Ultimately, I think that's some of the additional uh, angles, that, or that's one of the additional angles that uh, may be important in a, in a resiliency strategy uh, at an industry level. But then, of course, now we can uh, transition to our third topic here, which is yeah. uh, the strategies in place uh, that um, and what are you know the industry implications. And so, when we think of uh, of um, you know, policies that are now being uh, put in place or, uh, you know, for instance, uh, the Chips uh, for America Act and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some of the investments that are happening in the EU around um, European, something similar, European Chip Act. Um, you know, what, what do you what do you see are some of the strategies that are being now formulated in addressing resiliency or, you know, um, chip supply chain uh, resiliency? Well, I think that that all of those initiatives at this point <clears throat> make a lot of sense because, again, we learned from the pandemic. We're yeah. reminded that, there's, that there is a lot of concentration in our industry, right? So, so R&D is, is very critical to the fabulous community, to the IDMs in the, in the semiconductor space. And the government has recognized that for us to continue to maintain our leadership position in some of these markets, independent of where it's manufactured, we have to invest and it cannot just continue to be investment by the private sector, but the yeah. public sector has to also be involved because that's how it's worked. It's worked in the past. I mean, when you think about the internet, the internet started with the government investment, right? You start looking at some of the other industries in Taiwan, for example, Urso Itri is a, is a organization in Taiwan that helped establish not only the semiconductor ecosystem in Taiwan, but also fostered companies like TSMC and UMC yeah. that spun out of these government in initiatives. So I think the government now is recognizing like we did in the 50s and 60s. Um, during that time frame, there was a lot of investment in military investment, or you look at aeronautics or space, 
And we sort of lost touch from, I would say, from the 80s all the way up to now in that kind of investment that's required by the public sector. So we're starting to see some of that return, right? Recognizing that we need to invest in R&D. We need to sort of define our future and yeah, control yeah, it. Yeah. And, and you can only do that investing. So yeah. that should be a part of anybody's continuity plan is to ensure that not only are you mitigating risk, but you're figuring out where do I need to invest? And I think if you look right. at the successful companies during the pandemic, they recovered faster because not only did they have these plans in place already, yeah. but they knew at some point in time that they could not stop their investment. And in most yeah. cases, You know, long ago, Intel and Samsung, these guys used to always maintain their leadership position because during down periods, they would still invest. Yeah. And I think now we're starting to see that the public sector has to do the same thing for our for our country to continue to foster. Right. Mm -hmm. And to whether we end up bringing back some manufacturing or not, at least you're investing in 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 bringing a different type of skill set to people that have been lost in in this shuffle right. over the over right. decades. Right. And so, you know, when we think about leadership though, okay, um, you know, we can look at it in two two ways, right? There's market leadership and then there's technological leadership, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, what what do, what what do you think we need here? I mean, is it really tech, you know, market leadership in a particular layer of the the industry which is manufacturing? Because you know, like you were saying earlier, there's there's a lot of other layers to this um cake right yes and 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 the upper parts tend to be well they're expressing their value especially um you know uh, of late uh when you consider how the industry has evolved right from like the old school idm model to what we have today with you know uh, uh, you know a large representation of um uh, big semiconductor companies being fabulous. So I mean, what, what is that, um, what is that um, thing that we need to really focus on here? Is it the, the market leadership, the technological leadership, both? I, I think it's a combination of the two, but I, I wanna also put, put another factor in, which is people. I think yeah. that you know, the fact that you have places as small as Ukraine yeah. Uh, that you know it's very visible now because of the war but ukraine is is basically has engineers graduating at a higher rate than places like britain and other other european nations so it, it's still in this industry because it's capital intensive and it's ip intensive you're going to need very good people yeah. and china now is graduating a lot of electrical engineers we sort of lost touch of that and yeah. today we kind of move our kids in, into different areas and not necessarily into fundamental STEM kind of uh, education areas. And, and, and I think that's one area where we need to foster more. So I think it, it is a combination of market leadership and technology leadership, but it starts also with people and being able to train the people, make sure they have the skill sets to really discover what's new, right? And encourage that, be able to bring those people and accelerate their capabilities, right? Right. In programs that make a lot of sense. I think that today we just don't really have that in the US. I mean, you have to go to very advanced schools and universities to really be able to capitalize on that. But I think as if you look at the the higher, the rest of the community, we need other avenues for for people to retrain themselves right. to to adapt faster right so right. i think the people piece of it is is as important as being able to drive the next technology right being yeah. able also to drive the next industry but you know you know what you're i'm having an aha moment here so you know we're talking about leadership there's resiliency um i think those are two different purposes right but when we you know i want to go back to a comment that you made earlier that we need to invest in order to you know um uh i i think what the sense i got was to catch up right which is different from resiliency resiliency is about managing risk and, and 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 you know supply side uh, demand side, there's things that we could do on both, whether it's diversification, X, Y, Z. Now, one of the challenges that we have is if there's government investment or uh, public investment in the industry, it, it really needs to be a dedication to leapfrogging. Because right now, the reason why uh, manufacturing 80% or 90% or whatever percent of um, manufacturing is happening in, uh, in Asia 
is because of economic reasons, right? And so bringing things over, you're kind of going against the tide of economics. So the investments that we're having the public sector make into the private really needs to be an investment in, you know, really leading edge leapfrog, uh, some kind of leapfrogging strategy is the way I look at it. Because, you know, you brought up the whole space program. But the thing is, when we were investing in the space program, we were we were investing in the leading, uh, you know, the final frontier, literally. Right, right. right. What I mean, what are your thoughts there? I mean, is there something that we can be pursuing or use as sort of this, um, um, I, I guess it's a purpose or a, 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 a um, I don't know. Uh, I think when I think of investments, you have to strategy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I think you have to manage your investment too. So not yeah. all of it's going to go to these next generation technologies. In some cases, it's all it's the, the investment also has to be to refine what exists today, right? Yeah. And yeah. and also with the semiconductor industry, it's very hard to you can leapfrog maybe in cost every so often uh, or bring in a technologies faster, but but you still have to learn from each and every step. So, yeah. and, and that's, you know, I'll give you an example. When you look at TSMC, they went from 28 nanometer to 16 nanometer to 10 nanometer, and they didn't skip. There were companies that skipped and said, you know what, we're not going to do 10 nanometer, or we're not going to do uh, 16 or oh, 14 nanometer. We're going to go directly to 10. And it was for competitive reasons, but, but right. they struggled because they still had to learn from the previous generations, right? right and I think right. when you look at it from an investment standpoint, it, you have to manage it almost like a, a stock portfolio where you have these fast growing uh, technologies, let's say, or companies. Yeah. And then you have these companies that are, you would consider them cash cows, mm -hmm. but the return is still rich enough that they fund the yeah. future, right? And so you have to manage your investment in that same way. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. some cases, you, you support technologies because your strategic customers want you to still stay in right. those technologies, right? Yeah. So I think in general, the government has to look at it the same way. You're going to see some moonshot projects, and maybe that represents 10% of the portfolio, mm -hmm. but the rest of it is going to be focused on what refines today, what makes what we can do to automate more of what we're doing today. Um, and I still think those are areas that are fundamental. And then if yeah. you can also invest in the people, I think you have more likelihood of success and, and, and at least being able to show progress. Yeah. I mean, I look at the Ohio announcement by Intel. Mm -hmm. they're, they're already influencing hundreds of suppliers to also build around that campus. Mm -hmm. They're also uh, funneling an investment to the universities yeah. so that they can now retrain the people that are coming over there or at least provide incentives yeah. so that you can actually retrain the people that yeah. so that they can work in those facilities. So yeah. it's no longer about cost and I think we've realized uh, early on now that if you look at fab costs, less than 2% of it is labor now. So we can't continue to say we outsourced everything to China because it was cheaper because now Vietnam and Indonesia are, are cheaper than China, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you look at the makeup of a facility, a $10 billion fab, it's mostly automated. So a lot of this right. stuff is very technology oriented. So it's not a, a cost equation anymore. It's right. just... You're trying to be closer to the customer now. You right. want to be closer to the market really is. But okay, so I, I want to clarify something here though. It, we don't we didn't we haven't necessarily outsourced manufacturing to China. It's the right? I mean, it's Taiwan. Yeah. It was and, Taiwan. And South yeah, and so I think we just need to be because those com countries are not, labor's not cheap. <laughs> no, it's not it's not right. cheap, but they yeah. have the specialty, right? right? And they have the, the yeah. universities to support the technical people yeah. that you need, right? Right. Now, but going back to the dependencies that we talked about earlier in that region, which have been developed over the course of, dec you know, like you were saying, decades, right? China yeah. tends to be one of the newer entrants into this fold. Um, China's, uh, you know, there's other aspects of electronics, you know, manufacturing that where the labor, uh, the they do have that ar labor arbitrage uh, um, you know, advantage still today, right? Yeah. And which well, it's been makes it's been sub it's been subsidized. So the government at some point has been subsidizing the labor, right? So because when you think about the cost across regions, it's it's now marginal. It's marginal because 
the labor component as a resource yeah. is a minimal part of the total cost of, of yeah. ownership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and no, I, I think this is my, um, my favorite part of our discussion here. And I think one of the takeaways I'm getting from what we're discussing here is that you know, investment's important, but then we also need to, like you were saying at the very beginning, we need to look at it holistically and understand the economic dynamics of, uh, of what we're pursuing in terms of a strategy, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, it's it's not just about leading node or leadership X Y Z. Uh, actually, some of the better bets might be to be uh, in things that have uh, that lend toward uh, you know uh, economic viability. Number one, yeah. and then number two, contribute to things like resiliency and and then and leadership. Uh, but I, I mean, it seems like to me, we really need to be clear on what leadership means because it gets used a lot. Yeah. I, I don't know how people are, I, I'm actually pretty sure there's no consistency in what we're talking about. And I, I think that's something, um, that, uh, you know, we we've done here today is at least brought up some of those dynamics we need to consider as we start to figure out what leadership means. And I think that China is a perfect example. When you yeah. think about China, yeah, I, I think of China as a as a country that invented many wonderful things throughout our history, right? Yeah. And including strategy. And yeah. and and but one of the challenges that I see with China, and you look at it in the semiconductor space specifically, is that They've invested heavily in the semiconductor space. Yeah. But if you look closely, you look at uh, Singwa as an example, they're filing for bankruptcy mm -hmm. after billions of billions of dollars have been yeah. poured into it. And what we have to do in the US and in Europe and in other countries is not only pour, put in the money because the money doesn't guarantee you success. Right. It's being able to retrain and think differently about how you operate a business for sustainability, right? Right. So in China, you can get money, you can get subsidized. But what I don't notice that the Chinese companies that I talk to do is they, they don't reinvest back into the company. Hmm. Uh, same with the Taiwanese early on, with exceptions to TSMC and UMC and a few others. Um, they, they come into the market very quickly. They, they sort of pop in terms of their growth. And then they fall back down really fast because they're not constantly reinvesting. This is hmm. part of the continuity plan, the, this plan of resiliency, right? How right, do I create right, right. Uh, not only a demand for my products, but how do I, I create excellence in my yeah. ability to continue repeating this process so that it's always successful, or at least there's a higher ac accuracy yeah. for success, right? And I think that is still missing in, uh, in parts of, of the Asian region. Uh, I think the Koreans understand it very well when you think about Samsung and the Japanese as well, They, you know, because they've always had a very long-term horizon on how they view things. And I think China, China does too, but something is not connecting with the companies that are, that are being put in front of this industry. And mm -hmm. that's why you're seeing that some of the companies that have had initial success in China have failed just as fast because they just haven't figured out that formula yeah. that Qualcomm has or that formula that Broadcom has, yeah. where they can continue repeating the success story that they've had. Right, right. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so our last bit here, which is yeah. what are the risks and opportunities um, for uh, in overhauling um, the chip supply chain? Uh, for resiliency purposes. So, I, I mean, what do you see as the, I, uh, you know, the the opportunities and risks? It's the one of the biggest challenges I see is is this bifurcation of the world. Yeah, you know, you have the West and you have the East, yeah. and I think that's something that we have to look at more closely, especially after the decades of investment that we've seen to make our industry more interconnected, just like our financial systems are very yeah, interconnected, right, right? right? But what I'm seeing from the Ukraine and Russian war is that even though China has not really stated their position on the war, yeah. you, 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 you know, after the Winter Olympics that we just witnessed in February, yeah. you did start seeing at least on paper, more of an alignment between China and Russia mm -hmm. that could extend for a long time. Yeah. And that I don't think will benefit the U.S. on a longer term basis if you have this type of bifurcation. So I think the U.S. and China at some point in time have to kind of recognize that they're both equals 
and come into the table and then allow and foster the companies that I think have have made our economies what they are today, mm-hmm. instead of sort of creating these walls that we're now seeing being created, because I don't think there's a winner in that on a longer term basis. So that's one of the challenges. I think the investment that we are earmarking in our government from our government, whether it's in the US or Europe or Japan, mm-hmm. we have to really think holistically how we're going to spend that and where we need to really spend to establish that leadership or to maintain that leadership. But it's not just going to be about being able to to just establish sovereignty in in the industry as a whole. It has to be more than that. It has to be fostering R&D, trying to sort of figure out where the puck is going to be next in terms of the technologies and and making sure that that these technologies are commercially viable, right? That they really have something that that really can bring something new to to our industry. Yeah, I I I totally agree with that last point that you're making and the previous point as well. Um, I you you can definitely tell that there's a east you know versus west or west versus east rhetoric starting to um, to form. Uh, you know, you've seen that over yeah. the last year. Um, now um, you, you can argue that spurs spurs competition regional competition which uh, is good um mm-hmm. but to your point uh, is it going to undo uh, some of the beneficial things that has come out of global cooperation and collaboration like 5g or the work that 3g yeah. does are we going to go back to having four or five handsets because <laughs> each region I hope not. Has a different network. I mean, do you remember that? That really? Yeah, no, it was. It, 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 it wasn't. It wasn't too long ago, right? So it wasn't too long ago that we were operating in that yeah. manner where yeah. we needed multiple like, sims yeah. to when we're traveling. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think in general, I think there's so much to learn from each region. I've been traveling yeah. to Asia for over 25 years, and yeah. I've been to China and Korea and Taiwan and Japan, and every nation has their own unique value proposition. Yeah. And I think that we can all learn from each other. Mm-hmm. And if you put some of these these disagreements and, and, and differences that we have, there's still so much to foster, especially from a technology yeah. standpoint. And yeah. I think what's very interesting in, the, in terms of the, the industry that we're in is that it changes so fast, right? Oh, yeah. So there's always an opportunity to disrupt, whether it's yeah. a Chinese company or a US-based company, there's always going to be an opportunity to to disrupt in our industry right. and that's and that's been very clear and if you yeah. foster an environment where you can actually do that and don't hinder these companies i think there's a lot more opportunity for all for all of us to have right yeah yeah and i i think you're hitting on a, another important point that i think especially um policy need to be aware of is the complexity you mentioned the velocity of change but the complexity is um, uh, growing as well and That's right. uh, you know on top of that change and so a lot of the assumptions that people have about the industry um, uh, probably need to change in fact I know it needs to change yeah. <laughs> it's just some of that perception uh, require uh, change requires a tremendous amount of um, education quite honestly yeah um, education and, and just getting the right people that are willing to to listen, right? Not yeah. not stuck on the old values and the old structure right. that we've had, right? right? But right. people that actually understand um, they've lived in, in yeah. multiple countries, they actually understand what it means to be interconnected. Right. right? Because I right. think all of our industries should be. Yeah, exactly. And, and in terms of opportunities, I think it, it's uh, you know, uh, you've already mentioned investments in technologies, but really looking at um, uh, the the leapfrog opportunity, and it may just be a direction that's different from what we're used to. I mean, we've been so fixated on Moore's law, tra- tra- you know, number yeah. of transistors, uh, you know, per millimeter, or, uh, you know, these these legacy. Um, legacy metrics that we use to qualify and quantify the the progress of the industry, but uh, looking in different directions, right? And, and you know, as you are probably well aware, you know, things like uh, you know, in, in, uh, uh, packaging integration. These technologies are becoming yeah. increasingly important, and you know, like what we've seen with uh, Apple's uh, M1 Ultra. You know, they're yeah. 
they're taking some really unique, simple but unique approaches to scaling out, um, scaling out um, uh, their their uh, chips and their capabilities. So you know, uh, maybe look looking a little bit unconventionally at the conventional and like you said, think differently. You know, because that's yeah. where really we're going to be able to. Uh, leapfrog and hopefully arrive at uh, something at a strategy and execution that lends to resiliency as well as leadership because yeah leadership is important and no i mean doubt. i mean i look at this industry we're, we're we're heading towards a trillion dollars as a semiconductor industry so we have a couple years to go there but we're going to get there and that just tells you that there's so much growth to be had still yeah. i think there is a big migration happening when you think about integration, moving not completely away from monolithic solutions, but more towards yeah. packaging, because yeah. that's the only way you can scale. We talked about velocity already. We talked already about, uh, but scale is the last piece. Any of these industries requires so much scale, yeah. which means a lot of pouring of resources to, yeah. to make that happen. But I think that the more we move away from legacy, the yeah. more creative we can be, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think that's an opportunity. Yeah, that's awesome. So I think we covered everything, my friend. Oh, good, good, good. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> Sorry for having to well, take I, a, I, a, a, a glass of water here. Oh no, no problem. We're gonna uh, that got edited out. <laughs> I'll okay, tell you that right now at the end of the end of the taping here. <laughs> okay, but, no problem. Um, yeah, hey Mario, thanks again for joining me uh, on this rethink webcast uh take a moment to let our audience know how they can reach out to you find out more about the great research you and your team do at idc let us know yeah no definitely you you have my email address you're more than welcome to refer anybody to me and i'll do the same with you as well but but we're also connected on linkedin too so yeah. any questions they have or any questions you get let me know and i'll help you as much as i can Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. So just right down here on the bottom. <laughs> Wait, hold on. <laughs> there. Yeah. Here's his email and right. uh, reach out to him. He's a great guy. Um, he's uh, my favorite semiconductor analyst um, and a good friend. And uh, to our listeners and viewers, thanks for joining us. Please subscribe to our YouTube and Apple podcast channels. The easiest. Uh, way of doing that is just subscribe to our research portal and media center at www.next-curve.com. It's a great one-stop shop for all Next Curve research um, content, you know, Next Curve research content and media, and you will be notified when we publish new articles and content like this awesome webcast here today with my good friend Mario Morales. GVP of semiconductors at uh, IDC. Semiconductors and everything electronic, right? Yeah, yeah, and enabling technologies. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay, well, until next time, be safe and stay healthy. Mario, thank you so much. Yeah, so thank wonderful you, to have you. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the invite, and I, will, I hope to catch up with you soon in person. Yeah, well, we have to do it again. This is great. Yeah, for sure. All right, <laughs> All right take, well, care. take care. Bye-bye now. Visit us at www.next-curve.com.